Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all back uh, to these uh, honorary doctorate lectures at the Faculty of Theology. We will continue with the third and last uh, of this afternoon's honorary doctorate lecture. For those of you who have not been with us, and I saw there was a lot of people coming in, my name is Matthias Martinson, and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Theology here at Uppsala, and I chair these lectures. There will be an opportunity for a few questions afterwards uh, after the lecture, but just probably one or two. Uh, but our speaker has also promised to stay uh, a little longer afterwards if you want to chat with her uh, on some issues. So uh, now to uh, the important things. Our third speaker is Elaine Scarry, who is a Walter Cabot Professor of Aesthetics and the General Theory of Value, Harvard University, United States of America. Professor Scarry's first monograph from 1985 called The Body in Pain, The Making and Unmaking of the World is a study about torture and war. This book brought her immediate international recognition and a full professorship at Harvard. In 2014, Professor Scarry published a book, Thermonuclear Monarchy, Choosing Between Democracy and Doom. In this work, she argues that today's weapons of mass destruction are fundamentally incompatible with, democ with democracy as they give a few individuals more or less absolute powers. A very serious topic indeed, and unfortunately a very timely one as well. But Professor Scarry has published on many other topics as well. The latest monograph is quite different. It's called Naming Thy Name, Cross-Talks in Shakespeare's Sonnets from 2017. Another important contribution in my mind is the book On Beauty and Being Just, which is a reflection on the meeting points between aesthetics and ethics. Professor Scarry has been in collaborations with our faculty before, not the least with Dr. Brian Palmer, who is here in the room as well. In 2015, she held a very appreciated and well-attended lecture here in Uppsala on nuclear weapon and social contract. Professor Scarry, we are all very, very proud to have you here back in Uppsala today, and we are eager to hear more about your work, but not by me commenting on your production. We really want to hear what you have to say. Please, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, like uh, Lori and Sydney, I'm thrilled to be honored by this university and also heartened to be so welcomed in the last couple of days by many of you, including by your attendance here today. And I'm especially grateful to Brian Palmer, whose generosity many of you are already very familiar with. I want to speak this afternoon about the way in which beauty presses us to a greater concern with justice. Um, and in concern, I want to speak about the way the beauty of the world presses us to greater concern with the very dire problem of nuclear weapons. Both beauty and justice in English have a shared synonym, which is the word fairness. In the word, word realm of aesthetics, we talk about fair vistas and fair skies and fair faces. And then in the realm of justice in English, we talk about a fair playing field and fair arrangements. It's in English, it's the case that the word in the realm of justice is actually derived etymologically from the word in the realm of aesthetics, that is, the original meaning of fairness as loveliness of countenance or perfection of fit is the meaning that came first, and the meaning in the realm of justice came second. Both beauty and justice have another link, which is that both of them have as an opposite the word injury in English. And you can hear that in the case of justice, the same syllable that's in the word justice is in the second syllable of injury. Um, and it's also the case, I believe, that the most accurate um, word opposite for beauty is the word injury. Now, everybody has their own idea of what counts as the most beautiful thing they've ever seen or the most beautiful thing they've said today. And that plurality of objects 
is one of beauty's most important feature. Um, so occasionally I will mention a specific object of beauty, uh, but if it's not one that uh, you hold reverence for, just substitute another object. And because one of my family members was a few days ago in the South Pole and writing emails to me about the um, albatross, um, that's one that I'll, uh, for a moment, uh, talk about. Whoops, I think I hit the wrong thing. Yeah, uh, because I happened at the same time to be reading a book that I hadn't encountered before called The, uh, the Thing with Feathers by Noah Stryker, who points out that uh, the wandering albatross has a wingspan of 12 feet, which is 3.6 meters. Um, that it flies, it can fly several miles. It can glide or soar for several miles without flapping its wings. It flies 75,000 miles a year. In its lifetime, it flies four million miles, which is eight round trips to the moon. Um, and it spends 95% of its life over, uh, over open ocean. And it's for these reasons that the author associates it with restlessness and romance, but also with things of the spirit and with infinity. Um, and yet at the same time, the beauty of the albatross reminds us of much the beauty of much more familiar things like this gull um, in the Boston uh, Harbor where we recently had temperatures that were the coldest we'd had in 100 years and where the ocean uh, surf began to freeze, and uh, this very lovely photograph was taken. Um, so the nuclear problem, on which I hope to show you the relevance of, of beauty, is one that I think requires four forms of remedy. The nuclear problem, let me first say, is uh, I think probably many of you are aware, I think you're probably more aware than people in the United States, um, it is extremely dangerous right now. Our former Secretary of Defense, William Perry, says it's the most dangerous since the Cuban Missile Crisis. And and the latest research on nuclear winter says that if a tiny fraction of the current arsenal is used, not 1%, but 3 one-hundredths of 1%, 1 44 million people will die in the first afternoon and 1 billion in the first month. And the International Red Cross has said all its resources worldwide cannot even remedy the situation if one city, if one city is hit. Um, and so that's why it's imperative that it be stopped before the injury happened. And to do that, it requires first that we recognize how easily nuclear weapons can be unmade, uh, how easily their triggers can be dismantled, how easily the submarines can be brought into port, and so forth. Compared to other problems like global warming, it's actually an easy problem. Second, that we learn, at least in the United States, um, that is, in countries that have huge arsenals, to hear the call of beauty uh, demanding that we uh, dismantle. Three, that we watch and where possibly act actively assist international law, like the ban that's now going through and that is calling out for Sweden's ratification, um, as well as everybody's ratification. And fourth, insist that our own constitution be followed. And in, when I lectured here in 2015, I had occasion to talk about the fourth, um, which is actually the center of my own work has been on the way in which the US Constitution provides very concrete tools for dismantling this whole architecture. But I'm not gonna talk about that today. I'm gonna talk uh, more generally about the way in which the call of beauty um, bears on, on, um, on these, these, this very, very great problem. And when we talk about beauty, let me first of all say that we're very often talking about three different sites of beauty. Um, in some cases, when people are talking about beauty, they're talking about the beautiful thing itself. So it might be a poem by Keats. It might be the way the trees a few days ago were covered with ice crystals. It might be a mathematical formula. It might be a child's face. Um, but, but whatever it is, we're talking about the beautiful object itself and usually it goes on to we go on to talk about the formal features of the object such as its symmetry its integrity its clarity or what um, 
Aquinas in Summa Theologica calls its claritas, um, its integrity, and so forth. Um, at other times, what we're talking about is, um, is not the object itself, but the perceptual act of coming into the presence of the beautiful thing. And we have, over many centuries, many different accounts of this moment. The most famous is probably the account Plato gives in a symposium where Socrates says that when you come into, when he comes into the presence of the beautiful boy, um, his knees begin to buckle, he breaks into a sweat, his shoulder blades feel very uncomfortable because what's happening is sh feathers are beginning to shoot through his shoulder blades since he's remembering his life in an immortal um, realm. Uh, and we have many, many other accounts of the effects we undergo when when we suddenly see something beautiful, whether it's uh, something at an archaeological dig or something about a revised hospital or whether it is um, a poem or a friend's face. The third side of beauty again entails what happens to us in the presence of beauty, but rather than it being what happens in the first few seconds when our knees might buckle or whatever. Um, it's the more enduring effect. And um, that has, by many different philosophers, been described as an act of creation. So let me go back to each of these three and make clear the call to justice that is in each of those three, and in particular, the call to deal with this really catastrophic architecture that is presently poised to take away our entire um, earth. Um, so first of all then, again, the idea of the um, beautiful object itself and um, its symmetry. Some of you may know the theory of justice by John Rawls called the theory of justice. It's one of the best known uh, accounts of justice in the 20th century. And John Rawls describes justice as requiring um, fairness, or fairness as requiring equality in all of our relations with one another. Um, that is, it, it requires symmetry in all our relations with one another. And that's a very contemporary uh, theory of justice, particularly well known perhaps on the Harvard campus where John Rawls was a philosopher, but I think internationally very well known. But there is almost no account of justice that does not stress symmetry. Um, so for example, Plato talked about the necessity of a symmetry between crimes and punishments, and we still haven't figured out what a symmetrical punishment is for a given crime. Um, and we talk about there has to be a symmetry between work and the compensation or the wages that you get for that work. And so too, there has to be a symmetry between this person's co work and compensation and what this person who's doing the same work uh, gets for compensation. It ought to be symmetrical to what that person gets. Whereas in the realm of beauty, uh, almost effortlessly, the thing is present, symmetry is present in the object itself, uh, in the realm of justice, as in all the examples I just mentioned, bringing that symmetry into being takes centuries and centuries often to figure out, and in many cases we haven't yet figured it out. But in the realm of beauty, um, if we go back to, well, uh, let me first deal with the, the asymmetry that is in the realm of nuclear weapons and then uh, just remember how easy it is to find it in the aesthetic realm. So this is a graph on which we could spend a great deal of time, but I'll just mention the most important feature. First of all, each of those icons has to be multiplied multiplied by five because the makers couldn't fit all of the weapons onto it. But this is our current arsenal. And as you can see, 93% of the weapons are owned by the United States and Russia. All the ones from uh, three o'clock down to seven o'clock are owned by the United States from about um, eight o'clock over to one o'clock are owned by Russia. And then that tiny wedge are the other seven nuclear states. Um, North Korea has the smallest number. It has between, it probably has fewer than 20, but it certainly has no more than 60. The United States has 7,000. 
So this is an example of this extreme asymmetry, especially if you have spent any time in the United States, you'll know that we talk endlessly about Iraq's nuclear weapons. Iraq isn't on here, it has no nuclear weapons. We talk about Iran's nuclear weapons. Iran isn't on here, it has no nuclear weapons. We talk about North Korea's nuclear weapons, and indeed we should, that's a worry. North Korea has a tiny number of nuclear weapons, but this is what North Korea is facing. Um, so it's an example of the most catastrophic kinds of um, asymmetry. And asymmetry, it just radiates throughout this uh, architecture. Uh, here, for example, is a map that you can find on Wiki showing the nuclear states and the nuclear weapons free zone, treaty zone states. So the red indicates the nuclear states, the blue indicates those states that have uh, treaties that make them nuclear weapons free. It's the Treaty of Perlandaba, the Treaty of Tataloka, the Treaty of Bangkok, et cetera, et cetera. And it's countries in this, in this southern hemisphere that have eagerly stepped forward and signed the international ban. So there's a tremendous asymmetry between those holding the weapons to destroy the whole planet in the north and the people in the south, um, usually people of color, asking that this be, um, that this be stopped or set aside. Um, and there's a third tremendous example of asymmetry, and that is that the huge catastrophic injury that can be brought about. Remember, three one-hundredths of one percent can bring about 44 million deaths in one afternoon. That is all fired, launched by one person. By one person. That's the way the, the, the weapons are designed to be used by one person. Um, that's why if you bring constitutional measures to bear on it, you could dismantle the whole architecture because it's obscenely, appallingly um, a asymmetrical. And in, and in contrast, uh, the realm of, of um, symmetry in beautiful things is, uh, is, is effortlessly present. Um, the sphere has been called by Parmenides the most beautiful of shapes because it's equidistant in all directions. Bilateral symmetry is a very simple kind of symmetry. We want to include duodexahedrons inside octahedrons, but nonetheless, bilateral symmetry is pretty gorgeous itself. Um, uh, just to take things even closer to home, here's a picture of a snowy owl I took on the shore near where I live that seems to have both the advantages of a sphere and bilateral symmetry. Um, and this is a uh, tree peony in uh, my own garden, and I chose, uh, in respect to this department, the particular one that's called Guardian of the Monastery. Um, the all these relations between the object of beauty and the perceiver of beauty um, entail a, a, what I call a pact of aliveness. There's what happens in the moment of coming into contact with a beautiful object is an affirmation of a kind of contract between you and the beautiful thing uh, that is a, a contract or a pact of aliveness. And that is something that has been said by um, philosophers and poets over many, many years. And it's crucial because in the several decades when beauty was just excluded from humanities departments in the United States, that taboo is now um, over, I think. Um, it was also excluded from museums. It was also excluded from architecture schools. But in the period when that was happening, there was one area they kept using, and that was advertising. Advertising would use beautiful persons, beautiful scenes. And I have no objection to that, except it wrongly told people, when you see something beautiful, you ought to buy it. Whereas centuries of philosophers and poets said, when you see something beautiful, it's a call to you to begin to educate yourself. It's a call to you to begin to repair the injuries of the world. And first and foremost, they talk about the affirmation of aliveness that comes there. Just as a quick series of examples, Homer in the Odyssey has Odysseus washed up on the island. He sees this young girl named Nausicaa, and he can't can't get over her newbornness, new life. Uh, and he describes himself as having come from the man-killing sea. St. Augustine in De Musica 
describes the beauty of music as a, a life-saving plank in the midst of the ocean. So this is again gonna be the affirmation of life. Dante sees the face of Beatrice and he writes the Divine Comedy. But before he writes the Divine Comedy, he writes a shorter work called the Nova Vita, The New Life. Uh, that was his description of what happened to him when he saw the face of Beatrice. Rilke has a very famous poem called The Archaic Torso of Apollo that ends by this beautiful torso saying to the poet and to us, you must change your life. Um, and this can go on. Philosophers like Kant, Kant in the third critique of judgment, continually links the idea of beauty with the word aliveness. That's something I hadn't noticed, but a philosopher named um, Rudyard McCreel points that out. And so too scientists make us aware of the way in which beauty um, penetrates their world. And just to take one example, the astrophysicist Mario Livia, who's a, um, a, a scientist at the Hubble telescope, um, points out all the places where you see symmetry in both the arts and the sciences, but he includes in, as one example, the Y chromosome, the male chromosome, and points out that the Y chromosome consists of 70 million DNA sequences, six millions of which are palindromes, that is, sequences of letters that read this identically, whether you're reading forward or backward, which is an extreme form of symmetry that he says exists so that the chromosome can be self-repairing. And there are many other examples from less canonical Western sources. For example, one anthropologist points out that when he asked a Native Amer one group of Native American people what the word for beauty was in their language, the answer came back, aliveness. Um, so it's a, a kind of two-directional life pact, and it, it, how literally do we mean that it's the life-saving plank in the midst of the ocean? Um, well, uh, there's just many ways of answering that. Um, some of you have seen the photographs of Salgado and uh, one volume he has of the children in all these refugee camps uh, in, uh, from, from my, huge migrations of people. And in almost every photograph, the child is wearing some little filament of a bracelet or a necklace. Um, you say, what is, what is that doing there? Well, it's the child's life-saving plank in the midst of the ocean. It's the talisman that they're gonna get to shore uh, and, and so forth. But just more concretely, I think that um, beautiful things, first of all, they um, heighten our perceptual acts. They call on us to uh, carry out more acute acts of perception that we can then distribute um, to other beautiful things. For example, if I am hit over the head with how amazing the albatross is, it brings about a heightened state of alertness that makes me then appreciate the seagull that I hadn't been paying attention um, to. Sometimes my students worry that if we love one beautiful object, it will just swallow up all our attention and deprive the rest of the world of um, our attention. And so I always ask them to carry out the experiment of w watching the next time that they are walking down the street and are bowled over by seeing something beautiful and to ask themselves, was I walking along here generously paying attention to everyone and to everything? Or was I just numbly walking along, not paying attention at all, until this beautiful thing or beautiful cloud formation or beautiful face just kind of woke me up and then made me aware that I needed to distribute that attention out? And conversely, we confer on beautiful things the gift of protection that's given to live things. In the case of, let's say, a beautiful child, the, the, the beautiful thing actually is alive. In the case of a stream, we could say the beautiful thing actually is alive. But in many cases, the beautiful thing isn't technically alive. A painting in the Gardner Museum in Boston, where we've had a number of very valuable paintings stolen, including a Vermeer, um, when that painting is stolen, the whole world winces out of fear 
that there's going to be some damage done to that as though it were alive and, would, and were sentient and were going to be made to um, feel the um, injury. And so the, um, the result of that is that there really is a two-directional pact between, um, between the, uh, the perceiver and the beautiful thing. Now, it's one reason why I think that, or I hope that people, particularly people who have large arsenals as we do in the United States, will begin to, when they see something beautiful, not think I have to buy it, but I have to work on getting rid of one of these injurious problems, like the nuclear problem, um, is that environmentalists have often said that what inspired them was the beauty of Earth. One example is the very important um, environmentalist in the United States, Rachel Carson, um, who wrote the book Silent Spring in the early 1960s that caused people in the United States to give up pesticides that were killing all the birds and all the insects. Um, and she was also very much uh, anti, very much working against um, the nuclear problem. She was a biologist and in addition to Silent Spring, she wrote many other books, such as um, The Sea Around Us, in which she talks about the beauty of creatures um, in the, the uh, ocean. But she was fond of citing a passage from uh, Richard Jeffries, who's a 19th century naturalist, that makes an extreme claim about beauty. Uh, the exceeding beauty of the earth yields a new thought with every petal. The hours when the mind is absorbed by beauty are the only hours when we really live. All else is illusion or mere endurance. Now, probably for most of us, that's a bit extreme. And yet, the feeling, the, what you're seeing there again, is the heightened sense, the heightened pleasure, or the, the capacity to access the miracle of one's own um, being alive. So too, other environmentalists like John Muir, who in the United States founded the Sierra Club that helped put the public parks in a safe place, uh, is an example. It's also the case that the um, global warming movement has been pushed along or assisted by attention to beauty. And even though huge amounts more work need to be done on global warming, by comparison with nuclear weapons, where there's very low awareness, um, even with a president who's recklessly talking, making threats about launching missiles, you know, every few days. Um, but in, in the, at least in the global warming, the, the, though we haven't, may not have gotten very far, the population is largely um, on board with it. And a lot of that has been the work of beauty, as you can see from these um, different periodicals. Scientific American has an article called Arctic Beauty in Black and White, Alaska Before the Effects of Global Warming. National Geographic, The Formidable, Fragile Beauty of Warming Landscapes. Wired Magazine, a kind of hip computer techno uh, wizardly magazine. Beautiful polar photos tell a haunting story about climate change. Uh, NAS NASA's own uh, articles, Climate Change, Vital Signs of the Planet, beautiful Earth. Um, it's p played an absolutely crucial, if somewhat unconscious, um, part. And of course, it has played an important part in the nuclear uh, movement. And a very early example of that occurs in a book written near the um, beginning of the nuclear age, when Bertrand Russell uh, worked very hard to bring about nuclear disarmament. And he wrote a book called Has Man a Future? And in this book, he imagines that Osiris is just going to wipe out the whole of humanity out of disgust with humanity having come up with such obscene weapons. And he imagines himself, uh, quite heroically, going before Osiris and pleading our case for why we should be given a second chance. And um, as you can see in this quotation, the argument that he makes on our behalf is that we're capable of beauty. And if you just give us a bit more time, maybe we can uh, bring this about. 
He says, it is within human power to create a world of shining beauty and transcendent glory. Consider the poets, the composers, the painters, the men whose inward vision has been shown to the world in edifices of majestic splendor. All this country of the imagination might be ours, and human relations also could have the beauty of lyric poetry. For such reasons, Lord Osiris, we beseech thee to grant us a respite and a chance to emerge from ancient folly into a world of light and love and loveliness. Now, in speaking about beauty, I've uh, given examples from the natural world um, and uh, like clouds and birds and flowers um, and from the realm of art and philosophy uh, like the poetry of Homer and Dante and Keats um, or the prose of Aquinas and because I'm speaking fast here there are luscious passages in uh, Simone Weil and uh, Iris Murdoch about the way in which we undergo an unselfing uh, when we stand in the presence of something beautiful. We undergo a radical decentering where we no longer have to be egoistically at the center of the world, but we stand happily on the margins, um, which is a, a, a kind of uh, very, very important psychological um, reorientation. Uh, it's not itself a way of bringing about fairness or justice, but it's a precondition for justice that we not only be capable of standing on the margins, but be in a state of pleasure while we're standing on the margins. Usually when we're standing on the margins, we're feeling really awful. But beauty is the one thing on earth that makes us feel marginal at the very moment that it makes us feel a kind of acute pleasure. Anyway, I've used examples of poetry, prose, philosophy, and of course, natural objects. But I, I just want to end by taking an example uh, and saluting the beauty that is possible uh, within the realm of um, mass media information design. And one uh, expert in this area, Michael Barut of Pentagram Design, has called the doomsday clock uh, the single greatest piece of information design that came out of the 20th century. Um, because he says it compresses into one image a lot of contentious ideas about um, weapons and a lot of scientific information. Um, it can tell us how close we are to catastrophe and it can communicate that in the uh, blink of an eye. Now the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists resets this clock once a year. In 2017, as you can see right here, it was set for two and a half minutes to midnight. By coincidence, today, January 25th, is the day the scientists will reset the clock for 2018. And by another coincidence, the public announcement is scheduled for four o'clock absolute time, um, or 10, 10 a.m. on East Coast United States time. So just as our session ends, we'll learn whether in the view of a group of scientists in the United States, we've just moved closer, uh, which on one level we obviously have, but on another level, because there have been steps forward in the constitutional realm and congressional realm, maybe, uh, maybe they, they won't think we've come closer. Um, but let me make four quick points about um, the beauty that can occur in the realm of information design. And along the way, I'm gonna mention a second uh, information, a, 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 a second instance of brilliant 20th century information design, and maybe one of you will be responsible for the single most uh, important piece of 21st century information design. But um, I'll just quickly mention uh, four features of uh, the doomsday clock. By the way, are most of you familiar with the doomsday clock? Is this something you've seen before, um, this clock? Okay, because I'm kind of assuming you have, but it wasn't positive. So um, when I use the word beauty in association with it, I'm using a word that the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists itself uh, will be happy to use. Here, for example, is the inside cover of a issue in the 1980s where they had a picture of a, a very simple little flower. And their text that is hard to read says, 
why do we put this margarita flower here rather than real information? It hardly seems worth your attention. But everything important is encapsulated in this bud. Color, growth, beauty, the miracle of life itself. And then there's another version, just to give you an example, inside uh, another issue in the 1980s that reads, this tiny leaf with its network of delicate connecting lines was hardly noticeable when our, when our photographer picked it out of the forest undergrowth. But then it goes on to say, while it seems minimal and unimportant, um, that kind of network of life is what we're talking about in the way in which we need to join together to dismantle this unconscionable kind of um, architecture. Now, the doomsday clock, clock itself was invented in 1947 by a woman named Martel Langsdorf, who's always designated by just her first name, Martel. She is both a graphic artist and happens to have been the wife of one of the bulletin scientists. And over several decades, this design took this particular form with many uh, design, with many, many color variations, and also with many flourishes that I don't have time to go into today, but that are, are very, very genius. But one thing, a kind of second feature besides the self-conscious search for beauty is Martel's recognition that the clock face itself is a beautiful object. The clock face itself, which antedates by many centuries the invention of nuclear weapons. Uh, and let me be clear, I'm, of course the clock is a great invention, but I'm talking about the clock face is a great invention. And historians of science have gone over all the peculiarities this went through um, before the, the thing was settled with, which, with, what, we, um, with what we have now. Um, because, for example, it's a circle, it's an example of perfect symmetry, and therefore part and whole always imply each other. The quadrant of a circle implies the full circle, as is clear here, um, and the two dimensional circle in turn um, implies the sphere, which you remember is Parmenides' um, example of the most perfect of forms because it's equidistant in every direction. Um, it's also the case that the lucidity or clarity of the clock face in part has turned about a lot of, on a lot of thinking about numerals, about whether Arabic numerals or Roman numerals are going to be on your watch, whether the numerals should be radial, which means that by the time you get to the six, the six will be upside down, or whether the numbers will be vertical. But most people, as one um, historian whose name is D.W. Herring points out, most people, if asked whether there are Arabic or Roman numerals on their watch, don't even know the answer because we mainly go by the position of the, uh, of the hands on the clock and not by the numerals. And Martel just leaves the numerals out and just puts circles there so that she essentially has spheres within um, spheres. Um, the, in addition to the face of the clock, I think the beauty of the clock and its ability to um, act as a call to us comes from the fact that it um, has, has uh, two hands. It's as though uh, it's signaling with its arms, as though the, if you think of the man in the Leonardo circle who has his hands and legs like this, it's as though his hands just went up like this and he showed us uh, where we are right now. And it's this feature that I think yokes the doomsday clock with the other 20th century sign that has been repeatedly celebrated as a very, very great invention, and that is the peace sign. Um, the peace sign, as you may know, is made from semaphore flags, from the uh, signal flags that people use, because uh, the, le the signal flag position for the letter N is like this, and the signal flag position for the letter D is like this, 
And the peace sign is a combination of the N and the D, and it stands for nuclear disarmament, um, though we've now used it for many other um, purposes than that. And it is a kind of, again, a kind of signaling through the uh, flames, uh, a phrase that I take from the um, beat poet Ferlinghetti, who wrote a poem, um, I am signaling you through the flames the North Pole is not where it used to be. Manifest destiny is no longer manifest. Civilization self-destructs. Nemesis is knocking at the door. What are poets for? And he goes on to say what poets are for, and he says what each of us, our voice is for, is to dismantle this before it um, extinguishes us. Um, a kind of fourth um, feature that I think makes the doomsday clock uh, a true act of ingenuity uh, of a very profound kind is the, the fact that the, um, the spherical shape, the circle conjures up a sphere and the sphere in, t in turn conjures up an image of the earth. And this particular cover of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists where the window of time we have left before our destruction is, is indicated in blue. This actually comes from the, one of their 21st century um, covers from, from the year 2007. But actually the bulletin started using uh, kind of riffs on the earth inside the clock starting in 1963. And um, if, if many, many of their uh, designs will um, capitalize on that analogy between the clock face and the earth, which is, is not a, a kind of arbitrary thing because the, 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 a clock actually does register the passage of the day um, and the rotation um, of the, the earth around the sun. Um, it's even the case that the direction of clockwise is determined by the direction in which a shadow moves on a, on a sundial. So the analogy is, is quite literal and is played with in, in many different forms, such as um, this one where they'll often take a small piece of geography and through it, seem to conjure up the entire earth. It happens that this particular one is done by Martel, uh, you know, five decades later. Um, but many other graphic artists have done other renderings. Um, this one shows a core of earth hurtling through space. This was the window of time we had left, that little wedge. But it, in turn, uh, conjures up the whole globe. Even digital time as is shown here, projected into a celestial sky, still carries us into the space of illuminated spheres. Um, and then we'll just go back to the picture with which we began. The, the, the clock face is beautiful and um, calls out to us for our protection of Earth and calls on us to use our voices in turn to call out um, to the unmaking of these weapons. Thank you very much.